pushed me down a, a dark path that I didn't know how to lead through. Uh, I was in pain myself whilst trying to put on a front of holding it all together. Started drinking too much, kind of isolated myself. That then started this path of like, I end up writing the tough stuff about the emotional toll of what we do. And it started with that circumstance. Welcome to episode 15 of the Untapped Potential podcast with today's guest, Cody Royal. Cody coaches head coaches in elite sport. After a decade coaching Canada's men's AFL team, he now mentors 14 coaches in seven different team sports around the world. Cody is also the author of three influential leadership books, Where Others Won't, The Tough Stuff, and most recently, Second Set of Eyes. His coaching focuses on the performance and well-being of coaches, so they have access to their best coaching skills when they need them the most. And this is why I'm so excited to have Cody on. He is leading the way in this space, so get ready to give your full attention as you won't want to miss a moment. It really dives into the human element of coaching of sport, the rehumanization of sport, which I personally agree with, is so desperately needed. Before we start today's conversation, I want to draw your attention to the Practitioner Needs Analysis Coaching Program. The conversations in my research have shown clearly that 160 highly successful practitioners supporting some of the world's greatest athletes have on one level achieved a great deal within high-performance sports and academia. Yet on a much more personal level, many are quietly suffering to maintain the perception of being successful and happy. This is the inconvenient truth sitting just under the surface within a high-performance environment. The cost of this truth ranges from divorce, absent parent, physical and mental illness, all of which contribute to limiting the performance impact we all strive so hard to achieve. The human element has been forgotten, with many top practitioners now finding ways to leave our beloved industry. My research has spawned the services I now provide to support performance practitioners. Athletes have a vast array of options within their support network to help them thrive, optimize and activate their full expression but very little is currently aimed at offering this unique support for performance practitioners. And so this is where the Practitioner Needs Analysis Coaching Program fills that gap. The Practitioner Needs Analysis allows you to identify what qualities are most important for you to show up in your role, career, and life in your fullest expression. It provides an inner analysis that highlights the components of your life, giving you clarity in what is blocking you, how it's blocking you, and what you need to do to release those blocks. This guides you to tailor your goals and actions away from potential burnout, divorce, or illness, and instead to one where you thrive as a practitioner and in your personal life. To find out more about the group and one-to-one options Men Behind Sport offers, visit www.menbehindsport.com or email me at richard at menbehindsport.com. Now, without delaying any further, here is this great conversation with Cody Royal. Welcome to this episode, and Cody, thank you so much for for coming on. Um, it's really, as always, with everyone I'm excited to talk to, but you've got a really unique lens, and I'm just excited to diving into it. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate the offer, and I'm uh, maybe a little bit different from the other guests you'll be talking to from the performance practitioner world, but I, I think that makes it even more interesting. For sure, exactly that. And uh, you know, one, you're we've. Kind of, I reached out to you a while ago now, and uh, and um, and you have been, you know, you're like the, the the guiding light in sort of in your area, obviously, where you're coaching coaches, and and you know, again, another prompt that like you've you've prompted this podcast as well. So you've been really kind of very helpful in in my process. I'm quite kind of you know in what I'm doing here, and and um, and so I'd love to kind of cover today a few areas, but I suppose you know, just as the instruction said, you head coach, head coaches. Like just to dive into a little bit of your experience as a head coach to start with, and obviously, where what prompted you to begin this process? And, and when I say that is, you know, where were your struggles as a head coach? Were you experiencing quite a significant struggles yourself as a head coach? Yeah, uh, I didn't mean to be doing what I'm doing. I guess is the short answer. I was very happily coaching my team. I had the perfect the perfect situation for a head coach. I'd been with my team, the national team here in Canada, for about 10 years. I'd been an assistant. I took over the head coaching role. Uh, I had the most supportive president. Um, I had, you know, it was my culture, my jersey, my, like, you, you name it. 
And uh, in February 2020, uh, I got a phone call from one of the boys and and uh, his best mate, who was also on the team, had taken his own life the night before. So um, we, yeah, ran into a, a challenging period that even with 15 years of head coaching experience of open age men, you know, I started when I was 25. I, I thought at 15 years, I'm like, there's not too much that I don't know about in coaching. And then I get thrown into this situation where you're talking about a couple of months before our World Cup where 30 countries are going to go to Australia, one of our midfielders and central social figures and much-loved members um, uh, takes his own life, leaves behind, you know, three girls under six and a wife and, you know, a devastated family and, and all that kind of thing. And it becomes this, uh, I don't know how to lead through that or help 50 young men grieve, uh, let alone myself, um, let alone the staff and, you know, what are we going to do? And 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 that was the question. Like That's the, the question, even saying those words, like I, I've given myself goosebumps here because I had to sit on the phone and listen to all the boys and that they just um you know calling them one by one across the country and all just said what do we do what do we do and I can still hear it now what do we do as they're you know devastated and so uh that was the catalyst and then COVID happened obviously in the <laughs> a month and a half later and so all hell break loose then but um it really pushed me down a, a dark path that I didn't know how to lead through. Uh, I was in pain myself whilst trying to put on a front of holding it all together. Um, started drinking too much, kind of isolated myself. Uh, it was just kind of fumbling through. And so that then started this path of like I end up writing the tough stuff about the emotional toll of what we do and it started with that circumstance and being completely unprepared not that you ever want to prepare or can prepare for that but that was the the fork in the road for me that man I've got a lot to learn about leading and coaching and and just being a a, a man and learning to deal with right. my own emotions in that space Right, right. Uh, you know, you've gone there already, and and uh, my experience of grief is no one way. How, what are your lessons from such a unique situation that affected so many? What, what? How have you navigated that? And I suppose I'll give a context. One, my own experiences of grief, like losing my parents and, and a few friends of bottling it up or not my not with a mother like you know bottling up until i lost my mother and it just all popped literally broken but uh in um an interview i've done already uh if you go back to jack naylor uh, a few episodes ago he was working at psg and nick broad uh, was head of performance there he died in a car crash on a tuesday and they were expected to the french league wouldn't allow them to have a, a, a grace came off and and so completely different circumstances of course but but how there's no right on it there's I don't know what's your perspective on how to how you navigated that I don't have an answer and I don't want to pretend to to have one mm -hmm. uh the answer is I don't know mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I get a sense though that <laughs> or maybe maybe the language I've found for it is to grieve properly. Right. And, and I think that's particularly poignant for men because we're not taught any of that. Um, in fact, we're taught the opposite, right? Just suck it up and no one cares. Oh, and right. uh, if you feel anything, go to the pub and kind of wash it away. Yeah. And I know for one, that's not the answer. Um, I know destructive behaviour off the back of the pain that you're feeling isn't the answer. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't know what the answer is. But uh, 
one thing that I can confidently say is that maybe the gift that I've been given off the back of it is that uh, I'm wearing a, a Stanford shirt and they went through a particularly public, particularly painful circumstance last year where uh, their soccer captain, women's soccer captain, took her own life, Katie Meyer. And um, completely unrelated to that, I got to go and speak at Stanford a couple of weeks ago and I got to start my talk by saying, I know what you all feel like. And I think that reconnection or connection of humanity off the back of tragic circumstances is a gift for me that I now get to help people if they want to talk about things like that mm-hmm. um, because there's this impression that no one knows what I what I feel like or what it feels like and so I can't go anywhere anyway. So what's the point? And so, you know, um, I, I think... Yeah, that's something that I am happy to do. And I would say even in, in talking here, like if anyone wants to to speak about something similar to that, uh, please do get in touch. And I mean it, I, I happily sit and talk and cry with you and uh, go through all the emotions because I think the reconnection part of coming back to being helpful in society um, is part of grieving properly. Hmm. Yeah, I, I would, you know, you said, I would say there's treasure in that pain. That's how I describe it. If you can, mm-hmm. you know, so there's no right way and I, and I agree with you or you don't know the answer, but what you describe was feeling, allowing yourself to feel, which is uh, terrifying in my experience. Because <laughs> <So, laughs> you know, like, it's so, so used to numbing and whether that's through work or drink or drugs or whatever it is you know like it's we're just it's such a common it's just normal you know even drinking is culture accepted isn't it there's no completely normal going to get wasted at the weekend like um but yeah like that that is such a and you kind of you said already like the human the human part and sport the you know i think one thing that stands out to you as well not just because you said that but like the idea of humanization or bringing human, the human element back to coaching performance sport. We're a little bit ahead of schedule in the sense I wasn't going to bring this up until later, but it seems seems the place to do it. And so I've heard you talk as well, you know, in your books, kind of the idea of on one hand there's winning, you know, and that, that, that PSG example, the game was to be played at the weekend. It did go ahead because there's a league and there's blah, 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 all this stuff. But then, you know, how do you balance that? What have you learned maybe from the coaches or, or for your own experience? And like, I, again, there's not, I, I can't imagine there's one clean answer. There is no clean answer, but the balance thing between dealing with the human versus the winning. Yeah, well, maybe I'll tackle that backwards. I, I think um, like winning is human too. Like let's, you know, the reason competition is so compelling to us back through the ages is because there's a, a part of us that is is uh, driven towards doing that, whether it is uh, sexually or, you know, to, to kind of progress or and evolve or whether it's um, just general competition, can I beat you at this thing? And so let's start there. It is human as well. The, the over-obsession with it, is where it's become damaging and the the part of the like dehumanization is right the way through to having like under six academies and all this kind of stuff where it's like a a sweatshop for winning um and you know not allowing kids to be kids and then all, all the ramifications of that that go along in the pathway um but but also, again, it it is part of uh, humanity. It's a long time part of humanity, back to like gladiatorial era, right? Like we're talking hundreds and thousands of years of people being interested in competition. So we don't want to lose that element. But where I think 
that it links to what you were talking about was the reason I wrote a book about the emotional toll is because I couldn't find a book about emotion in coaching and leadership. It was all, you know, um, about it was either drinking stories with Gaza, you know, like every yeah, right. every guy who played in the eighties or nineties just has an autobiography, and it's just like, oh, and then Gaza met me at the pub, and and those stories are cool and everything, but um, or just like hard leadership. Here's how you win. Yeah. The human element of 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 uh, like the pursuit of winning, I thought was left out. And so I wanted to tackle that. I tackled it through the lens of emotion because it's lacking from we, what we call high performance right now is is physiological high performance. Right, right. It's not human high performance. Yeah. Because you can't have human high performance when you leave out things like emotion and like uh, well-being and and you know psychology is only just scratching the surface. And I don't think we're doing a particularly good job of it, quite frankly. Right. And so. Um, the reason that I want to rehumanize is because I actually think those are the answers. Those are the missing pieces. They've been sitting right in front of us this whole time. We can pursue winning in a healthy way. We can pursue it in a human way, but we've got to come to terms with the fact that we're going to have to start talking about emotion because it's in there and it's an element of high performance. And we're going to have to start talking about well-being and, and a whole human and a spiritual human. Right, and, uh, right. right you can't have a high performing human being who is only optimized physiologically it just doesn't work like that i completely agree and i'm so you know to, i agree like the spiritual side and you know this is a, of course an individual lens of that and my experience of coming into a spiritual understanding or, or a spiritual awareness you know I, I think maybe why or my perspective anyways why the science and evidence finds it hard is because that's quite challenging to put into research and into that lens. And I, and I think it's so encouraging to hear you say that, that bringing in those emotional and spiritual elements, because I have in my own experience, it has added such depth to my life and perspective. And also from what I hear, there is this, again, maybe coming back to the men in general, generally speaking, of course, from, the conversations I've had, a, a, a lack of awareness of, of that. Um, mm. I don't know if you found that. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, and and I think you're right. The you know we also need to acknowledge the limitations of the scientific method. And you know, again, part of that is back to what I was talking about. We struggle a little bit with the psychological elements because they're hard to quantify. Yeah. The scientific method can't account for them. Um, culture and team chemistry and like social sciences kind of sucks because of the limits of the scientific method, right? And like passing out what's happening and there's a psychological element to that. And so, but that that shouldn't stop this pursuit of whole humans. We know either just anecdotally or scientifically that these things are important to human beings and have been for centuries. And so we don't need a new paper to tell us that yeah. we probably should be pursuing these elements if we're trying to optimise human beings and, and create safe cultures and create high-performing cultures. Yeah. We don't need more uh, academics to tell us that those are worthy pursuits. I think we can just go and do them. Yeah. Yeah. And from again, for me, and I... And I you know, it's been fascinating reading and learning about indigenous cultures, how they operate in, you know, their their organ their cultures and their way of life. And I, I I from my perspective, I think there's a lot of value that could be brought into sport from those sort of wisdom teachings and and um which is, you know, I, I think I've heard you talk to um Aronisa about that a little bit around leadership and the Maori Maori in the Maori model of leadership. You know the the hero versus the guardian, um, and I suppose coming into like how how do you you know one of your quotes that stands out to me. I believe the greatest source source of competitive advantage available in professional sports is the optimization optimization of the head coach. How much 
I mean, obviously you're working with, with um, I mean, is it 14 coaches at the moment or 17 coaches at the moment? How has that, how has that evolved for you? And what I mean by that is, you know, all your stuff you're talking about, it resonates so deeply with me, but it, I think it, in my, in my stage of life, like how, obviously that, you know, 10 years ago, that probably wouldn't have resonated very much. How, how have you got into working with coaches? And, and I, I don't mean got in, but where are the coaches at that seek you out? I think that's, that's a better question. Yeah, it tends to follow a trajectory of therapy, really. Right. And, you know, you don't reach out to the therapist until you're lying face down in a ditch. Yeah. And so, uh, unfortunately, and and this isn't this isn't every coach. There are some that are already very high performing, but um, you know, ultimately they have a problem that that strikes them to go and reach out for help. Mm-hmm. And so, that tends to be the entry point. And that doesn't mean the team are doing poorly. And it, it, Sometimes doesn't mean like they look like they're struggling at all or that they actually have any particular problems. They sense something's off or that they can, that they're, they've got a lot of unrealized potential. Okay. And so that becomes the starting point. And then from there, you know, my, my big thing, and I, I write this when I send proposals, like there's no Cody Royal way. I'm not, I'm not selling a framework or some sort of, you know, system 12 week program that we're going to go through one by one and do this. It's the most useful thing that I've found is to get in there with them. And I've been a head coach too. And so you get a second set of eyes from a head coaching perspective on a set of problems. And you know that there might be a slightly different perspective on that issue, Mm -hmm. but uh, it comes with objective eyes and you can kind of start to get some um, some quick wins on whatever they need to remove or, or whatever challenge they're looking to kind of break through at that time. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, it, it kind of starts from a, a position of need, but then where it goes from there really depends on them and what they're looking to do in terms of their, uh, you know, optimizing their talent and, and really bringing their potential to the fore. How What's your definition of potential? I think you're, well, I don't even know if I have one. It's a good question. I actually don't think you have a set potential. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's an expanding you know a little bit like the universe, right? It's like expanding at all times and so, you can't actually fathom what your potential is until you walk down the road further to be able to see from that perspective. Mm-hmm. And then you look back at where you were a year ago or six months ago and go, actually, my potential is greater than I thought six months ago. Right. And so, yeah, I, I, I think it's one of expansion and it's really about colouring in as a, a, as much of that universe as possible um, in the pursuit that you're you're looking at currently and so for coaches that's that's often the coaching element the leadership element but also some of the missing pieces around family and Mm. fatherhood and motherhood and things that they're told have to be set aside Mm -hmm. but don't help color in that that universe for them Mm. Uh, in fact actually by them doing it by them being a parent for instance it makes them a better coach and so they're potential is expanding right right i I love that description of of potential or the idea of expansion around potential and i say that because i think there's such the idea of uh, self-growth or mastery it's better never stops i mean i've said this a few times on on episodes the idea better never stops the the london um the london uh what i'm trying to say tagline for the London 2012 Olympic Games, Team GB was better, never stops. And I completely bought into that idea personally and professionally and everything. But I think what, to me, what that shows is there's a lack of acceptance. It's a, it's a hard edge rather than expansion is, a, is to me, that describes a softer, there's a process, there's a, in the process, it's just, it's just this, this nice, gentle 
probably accelerated at times maybe, but this this gentle, uh, it's a softer description because I think a, tra a trap, and this is where I, I fell into myself, you know, the idea of practitioners, there's such a large focus on personal development. It's put under the idea of personal development, but really it's just a focus on the technical lens, which leaves this huge blind spot personally. You know, I fell into that and I've heard about that so much. And so, you know, coming back to practitioners, I would love to be able to bridge the gap to maybe some of your understanding of the head coach place to, to with practitioners. And I say that because there is at times, and I think some sports are more so than others, football, for example, or, or soccer, um, if you're American, there's an idea around, you know, that the, the hiring and firing rates are, are pretty wild at the moment. There's some of the stuff you put out and Callum Walsh put out. And, and so a new coach will come in, a head coach come in, and there's this, there's a, there's a self-preservation, one on the coach side, but two on the, on the staff within because of fear of simply job insecurity, needing to stand out, needing to improve the impact, that kind of stuff. And so what's, yeah, kind of through your lens of head coach, what are some of the coaches, what are some of the challenges? I mean, I know you've you, in detail in the tough stuff, but anyone in that lens, you know, like what are some of the challenges that, that coaches are going through to give practitioners a bit more of a different perspective? Yeah, so one of the reasons that I wanted to do this particular work and why I chose, I've been very particular about only working with head coaches. I get approached by assistant coaches and others and, and I say no. And the reason for that is that when we fix some of these things for the head coach, because of the power dynamic that exists, mm. my hope and my reasonably firm belief is that it benefits practitioners mm -hmm. by virtue of the, the new perspective for the head coach. And a simple example is the, uh, the first in, last out idea. Oh, right. It benefits everyone if either by my, I don't do this often, but sometimes my order to go and pick your kids up from school at three o'clock, right. if the head coach can do that, the head of performance can do that, the analysts can do that, the physios can do that, right? But if the head coach doesn't leave, chances are no one else is going to. So there's a really kind of basic equation that I think will resonate with most people is like if if we can get the coach out the door and thinking about themselves that it's not wasted time and that watching the the watching my two year old son develop skills has completely changed how I think about skill development. Um, and so if we can get head coaches thinking like that, I think the knock on effect is huge. But ultimately, uh, yeah, I, I think. You know, context is if I were writing a book of like my rules, like mm -hmm. context is everything would be number one. And the context at the moment, to your point and to yeah, what Callum has been putting out and, and studying a little bit and even just the general search of tenure, uh, the LMA stats came out recently and I think the average tenure in the championship was 0 0.8 years. Um. You know, we've just we're talking in in December. I know this will come out later, but we've just seen our first Premier League sacking of the season, right? And so it's about to start as as teams get into um, relegation battles. Uh, Eleven games into the NFL season, uh, Frank Reich, who was just hired in the summer, got fired, right? So like it's it's everywhere. And so that's an important context to know because it creates a behaviour from the head coach of preservation uh, for a multitude of reasons. One is the job, but it, we're talking about a whole human here. Yeah. So it's not just the job. It's that they know that everyone's job in that place rides on their success. And they, and they, they know that if this doesn't go well, the school that they just put their kids into 11 weeks ago, they now need to rip their kids out of that school and maybe send them somewhere else. This is a human being we're talking about. And this yeah. is the, the challenge of it all is it's been so dehumanised that we don't, 
they don't even spend any time on the, the news coverage on Sky anymore talking about, you know, the the person who's been fired. They're straight into the betting markets. On, oh, tell us who's tell us who's in line right. to, to take their job. All of these are important contexts because this creates a behaviour of, you know, that that unfortunately uh, practitioners have to deal with uh, a coach who either doesn't want to give anything away, wants to bring in their own people. And look, I'll be frank, if you gave me 11 weeks, I would do exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I would challenge most people that if they were given 11 weeks to change something, I don't think that they would actually act or, or open and let's bring in new ideas and please come and tell me what you think based on what you've seen. <laughs> no, we're going to do this my way with my people that I trust. And so, again, the, the context here is really important. Um, but I think one thing that all of us have forgotten is that we're on the same team. Yes. Yes. And ultimately, none of it matters unless we're helpful to our players or our athletes. It's the only reason that coaches are there, right? Like it's it's not really written into the rule book that we need to be there. And so we off, we have to provide value and, and help them achieve what they're trying to achieve. Yeah. And often that can get lost in all of this kerfuffle amongst the staff. Mm -hmm. And that's the saddest part of it all is that you end up with bickering amongst the people who are there right. to help. Right, right. Very much so. Very, very much so. How, you know, I guess what you're describing is there's pressure. Pressure on a head coach. You know, you've got 11 weeks to make a result, which then obviously runs down into everyone else, cascades into everyone else underneath. I am assuming here, from your perspective, there's very little that can be done about that within that organization so there's an organization team with the people who have got the the purse strings if that's in their mind there's nothing really you can do about that and what i'm trying to say is, is kind of connecting them to the human element to it because it's a business at the end of the day and i fully realize that yeah what are your thoughts on that yeah i'm fascinated by this one because the same owners and boards and directors who are quite poor at the human elements are the first ones to get on stage at a conference and talk about their culture, aren't they? Yeah. You're going to sit there being like, you don't believe any of that. You you <laughs> believe in the marketing of that. Yeah. You're you're a you're a money person who's interested in in money and you've made your you're smart enough to make money to buy a football team, which you're a billionaire. But now in the ultimate human pursuit yeah and team, i think team sport is the is the ultimate human pursuit can we achieve this given there are 19 other teams trying to do exactly the same thing that are training as much as us that are talented as much as us that have great coaches like us can we still win um that is the ultimate human pursuit and, and those two often they run differently within an organizational context and so I hope we can change that either by virtue of, um, gosh, maybe uh, maybe aliens coming down and uh, <laughs> passing on some scriptures. <laughs> maybe, maybe someone like Brentford becoming a bit of a money ball kind right. of thing where people go, oh, yeah, um, geez, it makes sense to keep a leader for longer than 0 0.8 years. Um, <laughs> You know, maybe something like that happens, or maybe, maybe there is just a, a realization that, you know, to get these teams and organizations to do the things that we want, that we do need some stability. Mm -hmm. And that when we hire really good people and we put them together, that the results will come. Yeah. 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 Maybe I, I don't see it right now, but these things can shift really quickly. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to release second set of eyes is because I wanted that to be hopefully part of a solution. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, just for those listening, like the, the links as always below. So this is a link to set, second set of eyes below and you can find Cody's other books on Amazon as well. Kind of this really nicely 
trans transitioning into uh, um you know like i guess what we're talking about is uh, the organization level the, the the purse strings the the people who are typically generally speaking maybe not so good with the human side and so making decisions primarily on uh, return on investment and so one thing you go into in second set of eyes is kind of um how can you kind of what is the return on investment hiring uh, a coach maybe you know whether it's the organization bring them in or the coach themselves bring it in and maybe sort of for me i suppose my initial thoughts i'm not read a second set of eyes yet um like you said this is recorded in december it's just come out by the time this comes out i would have read it but like so you're looking at well-being but i think also looking at the quality of decision making and i suppose yeah what are your thoughts on on that return on investment and to really the cold hard truth and i suppose give some context um I did a blog post a while ago um, and used a part of that the hints of, hints of performance. So I used to work for um, an organized Finnish organization I used to work for, and they released a white paper and they showed that um, meeting physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual needs increases engagement by two, two uh, times two, uh, energy at work times two, and then loyalty by three times compared to having no needs met. So their their way of sort of starting to touch into that. So I suppose yeah, what's your perspective on? And the cold hard truth of cold of return of investment on seeking coaching coaches for coaches yeah i mean one i see the return on investment every day because you you get the performer that you hired you know like neil craig says this to me all the time um, you know he he works with eddie jones and a few other coaches in australia and and the AIS and and he says uh you know the you know the coach that you hired like the one that you fell in love with at the interview process you know when you were dating each other and they were going to do all these great things and they, were, they had energy and they had yeah. color in their hair and they you know weren't grizzled and they looked yeah. you know that's who I can help you get that's right. what my work does is the the one that made all the promises of the things that they were going to do we can do those when you commit to, you know, having someone as a second set of eyes to help them keep perspective, to um, facilitate their ongoing learning, because learning is the first thing to go when there's a time crunch, right? And this is this right. is one of the big problems in leagues that play every couple of days, like in football, uh, like in professional basketball in North right. America, like in hockey. If I'm playing every second or third day, I'm not going to learn through the middle of it. Right. Um, but you can facilitate that. And so, you know, there's there's that portion of it. But then you can also just go into a really kind of basic, proper human performance research of knowledge workers mm -hmm. because head coaches do knowledge work. They're high-performance knowledge workers. And... You know, when you look at really simple things like napping and like breathing, right. and then you push, then you go into the research into uh, decision making under uncertain environments. So whether that's Wall Street traders or whether that's in the military, uh, you can look at uh, there's research into surgeons. You know, co the surgeon being coached improved the whole t surgical team performance. Uh, they didn't put a percentage on it in that research but the the information flow post surgery not just the actual event the information flow of all the nurses and all the different people that they had to tell in all the departments and the family and all of that improved right versus surgeons who weren't coached right then there's just pe people who are coached like executive coaching right and and there's been a meta study recently that showed that um, the improvements were seen in uh, goal attainment, pretty important. <laughs> uh, well-being, pretty important. Uh, other rated performance. So the team actually rated the leader higher when they were being coached. So think of that as your players. Your players right. are rating you back at a, at a higher rate. And then self-efficacy is the fourth one. And so you you feel more confident. You're rated higher by the people that you're leading. Mm. You your well being improves, right? And like so, 
the, the return on investments, I don't even think you need to put a number on it. I think right. you look at that and say, why wouldn't I, if I'm paying this person either hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, why would I not want those things for that person? Why would I not want those investments? Yeah. Knowing the impact on them personally, but then to what we were talking about earlier, the cascade effect of yeah. all of those things, because when the leader gets better, everyone gets better. Yeah. And that's the return on investment. Yeah. You're talking about such, you know, you look at like breath work, sleeping quality, like all the things that are, that are focused or, or to, some of the tools that are, that, have, that have driven towards athletes to offer them the optimization, however they optimize themselves, recover better. Yet there seems to be this blind spot on book that they're former staff practitioners, coaches are kind of immune to it. Or we, we like, it seems this weird disconnect. And I wonder why that, I wonder why that is. And I think, yeah, it's just, it's really, um, you're obviously working at a high coach level and my lens is, is at the practitioners. And I, and I think, you know, the idea of, of course, an organization is not going to provide one coach for every single practitioner. That's just not maybe practical, but I think having a, a a coach practitioner facing department, uh, my old, uh, an organization EIS or, or the UK sports Institute now have performance lifestyle. And so they're looking at the athletes kind of uh, uh, one aspect would be to allow, or psychology would be allow the athlete to have a variety of different identities rather than solely focus on. Um, but I think, yeah, like, do you foresee, you know, I guess one way my thought is, you know, that cascading down would be the, the head coach or the organization would provide like that coach, that practitioner facing support. And I wonder if you're external, I'm assuming, in the sense of you're not employed by the organization, you're employed by the head coach. And I think my point is saying that I, I think that might have to be the same for the practitioners in the sense of the organization will bring it in, but it's not in-house. Simply, I've heard many describe simply say that they would they would worry about being truly honest with those people yeah and that's one of the reasons that i've set myself up this way and not gone internal and partially because of the what you described there there is that concern and you know again that tracks to that initial foray into sports psychology where it's like well hold on a second so you're hiring that person that if I go and tell that I've got anxiety and depression, right. there's I'm trusting that person doesn't tell the general manager who I have to negotiate my next contract with. Right. And so if you're asking me, because that, that's not even a question, if, if you're asking me who's um, come from a disadvantaged background, whether I'm going to either tell that person something or get a $20 million contract renewal that will set my family up for the rest of their life, that's a no-brainer, mm -hmm. right? And, and it's kind of coaching is, is mapping that a little, little bit as well is why would I say these things within my walls when it impacts my contract renewal, my, my yeah. future job prospects? Yeah. Um, then on top of that is you get an objectivity from the outside I don't have emotional ties to people within the building. Um, you know, I, I go and visit and then come out of the environment. So I know the people, but I'm not in there day to day with them. So you can, you can really achieve an objectivity by being a close outsider. And so that's why I think the initial forays into coaching coaches or coaching practitioners or having a, a you know, a performance director that, has a lens on the staff and coordinating and optimizing the staff so they can deliver a good service to the athletes mm -hmm. is probably where we need to go first. Right. I would love to see it internal, but I, I don't yeah. see it right now. Yeah. But I my hope is that it becomes so ingrained and entrenched that you know we actually set up a performance department for our organization because yeah. the reality is we're sitting on these secrets of human performance and we're not either giving them to ourselves or even to exploring other avenues like mm. I don't know why our uh, 
ticket sales executives wouldn't have a psychologist, mm -hmm. a performance psychologist. Right. Right. To work with them on cold calling. You know, if I'm a 22-year-old just out of college and you're like, you're going to cold call CEOs to try to sell premium ticket sales, <laughs> performance psychologists could really help. <laughs> and, you know, I think they could sell more if they had a talk <laughs> with them. So why not share it with them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I completely agree. I completely agree. Maybe sometime in the future. I, I want to bring it back. There's a kind of just a couple, a couple more questions I'd like to ask you, you know, kind of coming back to what we started to talk about. And this is kind of, you, you were talking about like that, well, we were talking about the human element. So emotional, mental, spiritual element. How, what is the spiritual element to you personally? And I ask that because a lot of conversations around this, you know, for one, this is a very personal journey. It's very personal. I was brought to it in my own way through grief, well, through grief and through through being at the presence of someone dying got a couple of people and, and and i would say that's a privilege real privilege to be there and so that put me onto the well i'm gonna die one day what does that mean and so that's that's what's kind of got me into that and i think my, my point in asking this question one i'm i'm just personally curious you know love to hear your perspective but two i think i've heard quite a few people not understand what spirituality is Kind of there's a preconceived notion of what what it is based on things they've maybe read in a long time ago in the past and so i'm trying to kind of land this in a very real way so yeah what what is how do you nurture your spiritual well-being mm. yeah this has been a, an interesting one for me probably lifelong mm. in that uh, my mother is very spiritual mm -hmm and interested in all sorts of explanations of the universe from, uh, you know, kind of traditional Buddhism, numerology, like kind of cosmic universal energies and, and all of those yeah. kind of things. And, and I would subscribe to a similar line of thinking. Um, however, you know, I, I was also protected from religion in a way by that. Like I, uh, <laughs> my mother actually pulled me out of religion class in primary school because it was called religious education. Right. And, uh, but they were only teaching Christianity. And so my, my mum went yeah. to the school and said, if you want to teach him about all of them, he can, he, he's fine to sit in the class. If you right. just want to teach one, that's not religious education. And so he can go and sit in the vice principal's office. And so that's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> now that's not power, to say, power to your mother. <laughs> um, that's not to say uh, you know she, again she doesn't favor anything in particular, but uh, it was it was really just you know, she wanted me to be able to choose right um, right so and so that's what I've done. I was married in the Catholic Church in Ireland. Um, I appreciate the the history and the the thinking and the community. Um, but I, I really believe in uh, uh, the idea of the universe and yeah. the universe rewarding uh, certain things. Other people would just call that God. Right. And right. so ultimately that's where I've landed is that I hope we can start to appreciate that we're kind of describing the same thing. Yes. And that was one of my takeaways from Owen Eastwood's book, was he writes this passage about, you know, when he goes and shares these ideas, which are, you know, from Maori culture, whether he goes to Saudi Arabia or he goes to uh, Poland or he goes to, you know, where he lives in the Cotswolds in England, they have the same kind of story about yeah. the same kind of thing in yeah. their own language or in, in this particular thread of, yeah. of uh, religion or spirituality or whatever. Right. So all the stories are, are, are very, very similar. And I, that's why I kind of, I, I don't really choose. I believe in like a universal yeah. idea because yeah. I actually think we're talking about the same things. Yes. And, uh, so, yeah, uh, again, it's very personal to people, but I, I hope we can start to understand that uh, regardless of what you've 
or however you've decided to interpret your own mortality is that ultimately we're kind of talking about the same thing. And, and that tracks back to that humanity idea is that ultimately we're talking about humanity and, uh, and again, hopefully that can become a, a source of power for more people because to, to your point, it's in there anyway, whether we want it to be in, in ourselves, yeah. whether, whether I believe that I've got a cosmic energy from a meteor splashing down into earth and I'm built, I'm made of stardust or whether I, I believe in a puppeteering God who made me from clay, we're talking about the same thing yeah. and it's, it's within us as humans, whether we want it to be or not. Yes. My God, what stands out, out about what you said to me is just the diversity, like reading about different traditions, finding patterns in stories and the wonderful traditions and, and the, the writings and the scriptures that are out there, like just, just kind of seeing similarities. And that's certainly what I've experienced from not assigned to one way, but just this, 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 yeah, like this. Um, and I think, you know, if in one more, another way that got me into it was, um, fascination of the mystical experience and there are many different forms whether that's through you know look at research in psychedelics or breath work or just sitting with yourself and and you know and just in my experience i never ever thought i would spend any time sitting with myself and now i do regularly and it's it's just it's a very interesting states that can be achieved just by sitting there and then yeah, that's that's just my perspective. But I think, you know, having you, I think more, like you said, having more conversation around this and more conversation around spirituality, it's not about assigning to one dogma. I think it's completely opposite. It's it's hearing different stories of of perspectives, and and I'm kind of grateful that you shared yours. And as I've always coming coming down to the last couple of questions, I've asked everyone these questions. What is your what is your definition of success as you stand now? Uh, yeah, I've been thinking about this a lot through kind of changing careers, I guess, or mm. not even, I guess I was a coach before, but a, a different avenue, like pursuing it on my own. Uh, <laughs> the So Cody is a Celtic name. And... It means helpful. And so, again, talking of maybe some universal power or whatever, but I found that and it's this ancient kind of idea. And so I've pursued that as my measure of success. It's like, Mm -hmm. am I being helpful? And that can take a multitude of uh, forms. It can be my fatherhood. It can be being a husband and mm. my being helpful in those and, and that kind of there's there's different elements within that in that there's the provider element of my masculinity, there's the just generally helpful. Am I am I uh helping around the house? Am I helping with our son? Am I you know, and then it can span into my career in that Literally, I am trying to be helpful. The only, the, only way I, <laughs> the only way I get hired is if I help. <laughs> but it also connects me to something greater than myself and it's not a self, uh, you know, it, it, it's not just a pursuit for me. It, it includes others. I can certainly help myself, mm. but ultimately the success comes from being helpful to others, mm-hmm. which I think is the whole idea of kind of why we're here seems right. to me yeah. to help each other yeah i think that ties back into the spiritual perspective you know like deeply and so how or how i see it anyway kind of success is many of the conversations i've had success is so through the 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 objective measures winning and of course that's part of it or medals or papers published or conferences spoken out, whatever. And so, and you've given a, a much more internal description of that. I, I, the way I see it now is there's a twin to that question. What is sacrifice? And 
and suppose, yeah, what is sacrifice to you and how do you, which I think is always a moving target, how do you, yeah, what sacrifice to you and how do you keep, how do you keep a gauge on that? Kind of like, oh, I've gone too far, I need to come back. Yeah, I think this is where the values conversation, I think, gets really interesting in that that's what I think the sacrifice is, is the either your personal or collective kind of values amongst your family. And so that may be that may be time, for instance, you know, time away, and that becomes the sacrifice because one of the values is is connection and mm. and it could be something like that. Uh, that would be my line of thinking about what the actual sacrifice is. Um, as opposed to, I think the the traditional idea is is again it, it tends to come from more of a self serving place. I believe that you know you're willing to sacrifice your time to take the money to you know get the the badge on your on your jersey to say that you worked for this team, and that's a, a worthy pursuit. Uh, I don't agree with that necessarily again i believe in achievement and i believe in competition and i believe there are elements of that that are very helpful to us but that kind of self-serving pursuit of of yeah. sacrificing that to get man united jersey across your heart uh, yeah i don't think that leads to this whole uh this whole human that we're pursuing and this this really optimal version of a human being where their spirituality and their emotions and all the different elements that exist within us are um, are truly closer to optimized. Yeah, I agree. And and I guess the context to that, you know, like I can fully, fully appreciate, like you said, time. So training camps, major competitions, major tournaments, you know, building into it, coming out of it, like that's, times of sacrifice you know and, and sport is just played at the weekends mostly anyway as well but kind of some you know some pretty powerful stories that stand out for the, for the conversations i've had with some coaches you know sacrifice over 15 years like particularly in team sports devoting themselves you know kind of first in last out. how many days can i be on the bounce kind of the, the, and it's just season after season after season and then you know one powerful reflection was like did i i think i've cost myself having kids because I've ruined my relationship. I'm, I'm divorced now because I, I had this, I had this, the badge and the cause of the badge. And the, the, the bigger twist to that story was this particular practitioner had been at this club a long time and, and was just suddenly let go. And he wasn't even told he was let go. He found out through the press and, uh, or, or found out through someone else, sorry, who, who and he knew who was going to take his role in three months. And it's just this, this kind of skewed loyalty, loyalty to, again, something I've, I've heard about and, and I, I wonder if you've come across with that with, with the, some, you know, in your, your lens. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I spent 15 years in the corporate world while I was, you know, coaching. So I wasn't full time in my role. And so I saw that regularly and it's the same thing. And I think now that sporting organisations are getting to that size where they are proper organisations, you're starting to see that more and more where, yeah, you you get sold this idea that your loyalty will get rewarded and then you find out very quickly that they don't give a shit about that. Yeah. You are an item in most organisations. You are a cost centre on a financial spreadsheet and if the right or wrong person comes and looks at that line and sees is the amount of money that's going to that and they want it to be less, it doesn't matter who you are. Mm -hmm. And that's an unfortunate truth of it. And, and that's part of that. I think there's a rehumanization of yeah. that can occur as well. Yeah. Um, that has started to happen in the corporate world, ironically. Um, and, and you look at, I've heard it described as heartbeats as opposed to dollars. How okay. many... You know, how many heartbeats are we losing? Um, and again, it, it's just a more human way of even looking at it. But 
yeah, I, 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 I like your, you know, what did you say, mis, misguided loyalty? Yeah, uh, kind of skewed loyalty to skewed loyalty. bad. And, yeah, yeah, I like that. It's a, uh, there's a, I forget his name, but again, I'll put the put the book below. But um, the guy's written uh, his book is long, turning leaders into people. Um, he kind of coming from a, a, a Jungian perspective of psychology. Um, I'll send, I'll, I'll put it below and I'll, I'll send it to you, Cody, as well. The link, but turning leaders into people, it's a kind of you may, you may like it. And through the lens of, yeah, Carl Jung and, and, and Jungian psychology, it's made me, made me think of that. Mm. Um, thank you so much. Is there anything else that you, you want to share, you want to, uh, or, or say? Don't worry if there isn't. No, I just appreciate the the chance to talk about this. It's very unique and I love what you're doing and, and how you're trying to be helpful to your community. There's obviously a lot of, I hate the word synergies, but there's a lot of synergies between what we're doing. And, and uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I hope we can bring those together and I hope we can re-find uh, uh, a collective approach that doesn't kind of pit head coaches against yeah. performance practitioners right. like we're, we're actually derivative of each other there's no reason um you know it wasn't so long ago that the fitness coach was the head coach right right <laughs> and the psychologist <laughs> was the head coach and the bus driver was there <laughs> right? like we're, we're we're still we're still finding our way here but there is zero reasons for those to be pitted against each other yeah and so, again, I, I hope in a weird way our work actually comes together in the future and that we can just be helpful to coaches in general and people that are pursuing really difficult things and things that haven't been done before because those are worthy pursuits. And, uh, yeah, we, we just can't forget that we're all on the same team here and that includes the staff. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I completely agree. And It's been so good to talk about the the human side and I guess that theme has come through all the conversation but this particularly and you know diving into spirituality and you know I hope that offers those listening permission to be curious above all else just you know like well, what is what does make a human a whole human and and find your version of that you know and and yeah but um like I say your second seconds link to seconds advice below your website your social handles are all below and um yeah, keep doing what you're doing, Cody, and I'm excited to see where it, where it keeps expanding. Thanks, Matt. You too. Thank you for listening to this episode. And as always, please can I invite you to like, to share, and to please leave a review on Spotify or iTunes. It will just help spread this podcast to practitioners that need it.